friends. Let me introduce Professor Christian Ludwig, the moderator of this keynote. Professor, the floor is yours. Okay, um, buenas, muy buenos dias, muy buenas tardes a todos. Um, welcome everyone to this um, plenary. Es un uh, gusto darles la bienvenida a este espacio learning autonomy in the university classroom, exploring opportunities and experiencing limits. Antes de empezar, me permito recordarles rápidamente la forma en que se desarrollará la actividad. La presentación tendrá una duración de 50 minutos, 50 minutes, um, tiempo en el cual les pedimos atentamente permanecer con sus micrófonos apagados, por favor. Durante la exposición podrán hacer uso de la ventana de chat aquí um, para enviar comentarios y preguntas al ponente. Transcurridos los 50 minutos de presentación, abriremos un espacio de 10 minutos para responder preguntas or questions after the talk. We'll have 10 minutes for questions. Um, our speaker today, Dr. Anja Burkhardt, is maestra de inglés y francés en la Universidad de Graz en Austria. Tiene un doctorado en metodología de la enseñanza de idiomas y un interés particular en el desarrollo del aprendizaje independiente y en el uso y el uso del inglés con fines académicos. En el 2010 obtuvo un premio a la docen docen docencia en el y en el 2008 se volvió miembro de la Asociación Internacional de Profesores de Inglés como Lengua Extranjera o IATF por sus siglas en inglés. Actualmente está a cargo de los eventos de la LASIC o Learner Autonomy Special Interest Group. Anya Boca has, um, um, has been a long-standing member of our SIG, so I'm very happy to um, introduce her today. A continuación daremos inicio con Learner Autonomy in the University Classroom, exploring opportunities and experiencing limits de la doctora Anja Burkhardt, un gran asistente de la autonomía en el aprendizaje de lenguas extranjeras. Adelante, por favor. Thank you very much, Christian, for this introduction. Muchas gracias. So, hello, everyone. Buenos días. I'm very happy to be with you today. And I would like to thank Adelia and her organizing team for inviting me to give this talk. I'm Anja Burkert from Graz in Austria, and I would like to share with you my experiences with introducing aspects of a pedagogy for autonomy into my university classroom. Please sit back, make yourself comfortable, and uh, let me introduce you and invite you to come with me on my learner autonomy journey. When teaching is guided by principles of constructivism, the classroom will become a learning workshop in which learners will be researchers who are busy gathering, analyzing and working on knowledge. It's actually this quote by Dieter Wolf, which made me, when I discovered it, really rethink my whole teaching practice. I realized at that moment that my classroom looked really different from the description Dieter Wolf is providing here. And you could say that this quote, together with the classroom practice of Leni Dam and the writings of David Little, really got me started on my learner autonomy journey. So let me first give you a brief overview of my talk. I would like to tell you a bit about my personal teaching and learning environment and then uh, share with you my understanding of learner autonomy. The main part of my talk will be about my personal teaching approach. So which aspects of learner autonomy I've introduced into my classroom and also which are my priorities uh, in teaching. After that, I will share a few small scale studies which I've carried out over the years with my students in order to find out how they reacted to the changes I've added to my classroom. And finally, I would like to share my experiences with the online teaching, which has been going on for three semesters now. Concerning my personal teaching and learning context, um, as I said, I'm based in Graz in Austria. We've got different universities and I also work at different universities and different university institutes. My main job is teaching future teachers of English and diploma students of English at the Karl Franzens University of Graz. And there I teach grammar courses to first and fifth semester students and EAP to first semester students. 
I also give whole day seminars on writing research papers to medical doctors at the medical university. I also teach general English courses at the University of Technology. And finally, at the Center for Language, uh, Plurilingualism and Didactics, which is also called Treffpunkt Sprachen. I teach English academic writing courses and also intensive grammar classes. And I've taken up uh, teaching French again. I actually started again one year ago. And uh, I'm generally, uh, I generally love teaching French and I'm very fond of my French classes. So I've taught uh, six French classes now. It's been a bit of a challenge uh, with starting French again after um, teaching only English for a long time and uh, starting actually French with online teaching. In all my classes, I've got about 25 students and uh, we teach our classes once a week for one and a half hours. Uh, the semester um, has about 12 to 15 um, sessions and we've got a written midterm and a written final exam. Uh, at the English department, there are about uh, six to 10 uh, grammar and EAP classes every semester. And all these classes are taught by different teachers, but we all use the same uh, ready-made course handout. And um, as the, the exams are taken by all students at the same time, and actually the same exam is taken by all students, uh, this leaves us very little space for any kind of flexibility or um, choice. Our exams also are very formalized. We have, for example, in the uh, grammar uh, exam, we've got a fill in where students um, have to fill in a verb in the correct tense and we've got 20 gaps. So this is uh, quite a challenging task, especially for students who are maybe not analytical thinkers, I would say. So from all these constraints, I think you can see that it is quite a challenge to introduce learner autonomy and uh, give students space, uh, flexibility, etc. But actually, I was determined to take the first few small steps, like uh, Leni uh, advises us to do here. She said, essentially, it is a matter of getting started. It's a matter of actually taking the first steps small steps. And um, then you can sort of start creating a learning environment where learners are encouraged to make decisions concerning their own learning, where the teacher dares to let go. I would say this for me was the most important thing and the most difficult thing to do. Where evaluation becomes an integral part of the course and where the learning process is made visible. And also David, David Little, stresses again how difficult it is for the teacher to relinquish uh, the idea that all the success, so the success of the lesson and the success of the learning um, is dependent on you, the teacher. So as a teacher who wants to establish a learning environment uh, which um, gives responsibility to the learners, uh, it is important to start, really start trusting the learners and believing in their capacities. So what did I do first? Uh, the first thing I did was actually introducing uh, learner diaries. So a learner diary, um, the idea for the learner diary, I actually adopted it, I ad adopted it from Lady Dam. And then I uh, took over her guiding questions, but I adapted them to my learning context. So uh, my questions actually are, what did we do in today's class? So that is the content question, but I always tell my students to limit this uh, to a actually minimum because we all know what we did. Um, the main thing is how and why did we do it? And what did I learn? So what is new for me or what was new for me? What was relevant for me? Um, what could I take away from this class mainly? And I also added, uh, do I have any questions or need more information, more practice, more exercises from the teacher? And what are my goals for the next few weeks or month even? So you can see that for me, the learner diary is a tool for reflection, also for evaluation. So evaluating your own 
learning progress, also evaluating my class and goal setting. And I always ask all the students to keep the learner diary and two students in each class have to send me their reflections. So I always take the registration list, the alphabetical list, and I ask the first two students to send me the learner diary after the first lesson, then the second two students and so on. And at this point, I would like to pause and I'll try to share my the chat with you. Yes, I've got it now. And I would ask you um, to tell me if you have got any experiences with keeping learner diaries. If you keep a learner diary with your students, could you just type in yes or no? Not sure if I can see it actually. <laughs> I think I can't really see it. That's my problem here. No, I can't see the comments. Ah, yeah, I can now. I do know, yes, okay. Okay, there are quite a few, yes. Yeah. Could I just ask the no person for the time being uh, why you don't keep a learner diary? Why don't you keep a learner diary? I can't see any comments. Maybe someone is still typing. And the yes people, do you also use guiding questions in your learner diary? Or do you leave it open? Because I also tell my students, of course, that they don't have to always answer these guiding questions. Um, okay, yeah. Okay, five questions, interesting. In lower levels you do. Okay, so I guess this is the no person. You've got too many groups. Okay, yes. This in front. Okay, yeah. So, well, for me, uh, what I always do, I tell my students, because when I first announce uh, that they have to keep a learner diary, they think that this is an extra work, extra burden for them. And I always say, please just sit down for 10 minutes and it should never take you longer than 10 minutes to uh, write down your reflections. Yeah. Okay, so you do it. Uh, so it's not an obligatory, obligatory task for your students, but it is optional. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, this reminds me actually of one semester, um, because one of you said that you've got too many classes, too many students. One semester, I think that was two years ago. Uh, before, at least before the online teaching, I remember that I had so many courses at the English department, so many grammar courses that I said to myself, I'll never manage to read all the learner diary reflections. And um, actually, so I did without them. But what happened was that after three weeks, I really felt that there was some kind of, I don't know what to say, a sort of gap between the students and myself. It was so weird not giving, getting regular feedback from them. So I really regret it actually, that I hadn't told them or asked them to do that from the beginning. So I'll close the chat and I think I have to go on here, yeah. Okay, so thank you for all your uh, replies, that's great. So the next thing I did, and actually this, um, was the most far reaching change uh, in my classroom because this influenced everything, the whole atmosphere in my classroom and everything that was going on in my classroom. What I did was change the seating arrangement. I uh, always put my students in groups of four and uh, during the whole lesson, they sit and work in groups of four. This doesn't mean that they do all the tasks together for example, in the grammar classes, I always tell the students to do the exercises on their own first and then discuss their results. 
And uh, Lenny Dumm says, actually, when you move from a teacher-centered to a learner-centered teaching and learning situation, it is also necessary to make this shift of focus from the teacher to the student or to the learner visible by actually arranging the tables in groups of four, because this also facilitates the passing over of responsibility to the learners. So here you can see uh, my students working in groups of four. And uh, what I do um, in the first lesson, so when the semester begins, I always arrange the tables before the students come in. So it's um, often very nice to see that because the students are always uh, surprised because I think I'm the more or less the only teacher who does that. And then they sit down and at the beginning they're a bit hesitant and shy. But then after a half an hour, the, <laughs> the atmosphere in the classroom has changed completely. And I would like to now show you a short video where my students are engaged in a task in EAP. That's actually a linking task. I'm not sure if you can really um, hear well. Uh, Okay, and actually, as I was saying before, this seating arrangement has changed everything in my classroom. And of course, working in groups of four enables collaboration. And uh, so what we do in the classroom is, uh, for example, peer reviewing. In the grammar class, students have to write uh, homework texts and they peer review each other's texts. Then we do a lot of collaborative writing in EAP. Students write paraphrases together. They write paragraphs together. And as I said earlier, in the grammar class, they do the exercises first and then they share their results. Uh, Emma Ushioda says that um, a collaborative learning environment creates the appropriate psychological conditions for intrinsic motivation as it puts the control of the learning process into the hands of the learners. And this also, according to her, uh, harnesses peer group solidarity and shared responsibility, and it minimizes the feeling that the teacher controls the whole lesson. So here I've got um, actually two examples uh, from learner diaries. And you could see uh, earlier the guiding questions. So there was no question about the collaborative aspect of the university classroom, but um, some of my students chose in their learner diaries uh, to uh, comment on this collaborative aspect. And this is actually the passage in yellow. So if you would like to read it yourselves, please. And here I've got a second one for you. I simply had to choose this one because I so much like the first sentence. <laughs> okay. So what are now my priorities in the language classroom? For me, it is actually vital and crucial to establish a positive and supportive classroom atmosphere. I also want my students to engage in their tasks actively. I want to encourage cooperation and not competition. And I also want a, an environment where students learn from each other, from better, but also from weaker students. 
and where everything in the classroom is discussed, not only my input, but also the students' ideas, questions, thoughts, etc. I also, by seating them into groups of four, I want to reduce their anxiety and inhibition when speaking in front of others. I know from experience, because I'm also actually a rather shy person and uh, speaking in front of a large group is normally quite a challenge for me. But if I uh, have to speak up in a small group of people, I feel comfortable, I feel at ease. I also want uh, to allow my students to take on diverse discourse roles, not only to answer my questions. I also want my students to ask each other questions, to always back up their arguments, to challenge each other's propositions, etc. And finally, what is important in the language class is to enhance student speaking time. And uh, this is a very positive side effect of a collaborative learning environment and a seating arrangement in groups. So to put it into a nutshell, this is sort of my motto uh, in teaching. Um, success depends less on materials, techniques and linguistic analysis and more on what goes on inside and between the people in the classroom. So at this point, um, again, I would ask you to share with me your top priorities in the language classroom. Take uh, a few seconds um, and please think about what are your top priorities in your teaching. Okay, so would you now please type them in the chat? Yeah, thank you very much. Making students feel at ease is important. So it's giving them a sense of accomplishment. Great. Yeah, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Involve students with the learning of the language. Promote confidence, super. Risk-taking, absolutely. Not being afraid of mistakes. Yeah, that's one aspect of a pedagogy for autonomy that you see mistakes sort of positively to enjoy the learning process. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think we share a lot here, actually. Okay, thank you very much for this. So let me go on. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I said at the beginning that I would like to share a few small scale studies which I've carried out with my students at the University of Graz over the years. And uh, the first um, more important study I carried out was the study into the joint construction of meaning and understanding. And uh, actually for this study, I took the framework of exploratory talk uh, by Neil Mercer as a basis. And I audio recorded my students when they were working collaboratively on various tasks. And uh, the research question was, uh, to what extent are my students really using language efficiently as a means of thinking and learning together? Because I was not sure if what is going on in the classroom and in the talking in groups is always efficient talking. Uh, this is a definition of exploratory talk. So students or learners engage critically, but constructively with each other. And um, they uh, actually challenge each other's propositions. And there are also counter challenges. And the main thing that, that there is that uh, students, when they make uh, propositions or make claims, that they back up their claims, give reasons. 
and that there is always a sort of uh, joint uh, progress um, which they have uh, in view and uh, the knowledge is made publicly accountable and also reasoning is going on in their talk. And uh, this, all this is actually based on uh, Douglas Barnes' research into classroom uh, talk. And Douglas Barnes actually advocates uh, a dialogic approach. And uh, he says, because if um, it is the case that only the teacher tells and the pupils reply, then uh, this actually is ignoring and rejecting the function of speech and writing as a means of learning. So um, just to show you a bit uh, what I found out and what uh, I analyzed actually, I thought I should share with you um, a short excerpt from uh, a transcript I uh, made. Actually, this was a peer reviewing task. Uh, Peter and Anita are second semester students. That was a second semester grammar class. And the students had to write a homework text which was based on class discussions. We always use this as a starter activity in the grammar class. And uh, the discussion was about uh, whether students are good communicators or not. And based on the class discussion, students had to go home and write a 250 word text. And then uh, in the second lesson, actually at the beginning of the second lesson, they all came with their uh, printed texts and I asked them to uh, peer review them. So uh, Peter and Anita, I knew Peter from the first semester grammar class. So Peter was familiar with peer reviewing. Anita was a new student in my class. She had done the first semester course with a different teacher. So if it's okay with you, I'll read it out to you. I actually still uh, very well remember the two students and also their voices. And um, so I would like to read it out. So Peter says, uh, are you ready? And Anita says, sure. Uh, well, I'd say your text is really good. Thank you. I only found one mistake. It's here, a comma. I'd put a comma after, for example. Okay. Because, yeah, it's something you have to do. You always have to do. So you have to put a comma before and after, for example. I think he actually, I told him, which is not always true, actually, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I wasn't sure about that. Like I corrected it three times and then, yeah. Yeah, apart from this, great. I really like it, nice text. And now Anita is uh, commenting on Peter's text. I like your structure. Okay. You even build it from the beginning. So you have a nice introduction and a nice end. And like you stated everything in the first sentence and write your main points based on the sentences. So that was really good. Yes. And I'm not sure about some points. So now the criticism starts. Yeah, let's go through it. Is this end too much? What do you mean? Um, I don't know if you need it. Oh, okay. What would you suggest? Leaving it out, leaving it out, okay. Ah, I think it's, it's two different aspects. Okay, because I say it's like a list. In our modern days, and they are available too. So it's a separate aspect, I would argue. How did you understand it? I just read like mobile and. Oh yeah, that's different. That's why the end made no sense to me. All right, yeah, you're right, I'll consider it. Okay, otherwise I, oh no, no, leave it, leave it, definitely, I wouldn't have thought about it. And then both laugh. So you can see that there is real reasoning, yeah, that students really engage with each other's texts. And um, in the study, I actually found out that in most conversations, a lot of exploratory talk was going on. And I was quite happy about finding that out, of course. I did another study with a colleague of mine, Pia Resnik, uh, who worked in the linguistic department uh, at the English department. And um, this was a study into the pragmatic competence of the students. So actually we thought that uh, peer reviewing is quite a challenging task for students because they have to criticize each other's texts. So we thought that through peer rev reviewing and collaborative learning, uh, students would also develop and improve their pragmatic uh, competence. 
And uh, we actually uh, used uh, concepts like linguistic politeness and positive and negative phase as our basis. And um, the research questions were uh, the following. So which strategies of face management do students use? And do they show respect and concern for their peers, self-esteem and freedom for their positive uh, face? Or, and do they try to mitigate face threatening acts when they have to criticize their peers work? So again, what I did was audio record the students and this uh, time only when they were engaged in peer reviewing tasks. So I've actually taken a few slides from our presentation, which we prepared originally, uh, Pia and I. So you'll see it's uh, actually a linguistic analysis. So again, this is an extract from uh, the transcript and we've got students A and B and you can see some sentences which are important and which Pia analyzed. Actually, my colleague did the linguistic analysis and they are in green. So it starts with, okay, well, first of all, I pretty much analyzed your structure of the text and I think that it's pretty good structured, pretty well structured. Uh, there are about four to five paragraphs, etc. So this sentence, according to my colleague, student A starts with praise of student B's text, which is a showing or uh, protecting the face of the other person, showing respect, showing concern. Then we've got uh, there's more space between the first and second, so obviously uh, the student left out too many spaces. Um, okay, okay, yeah, okay. Uh, let's see, that's the maximum of agreement again. Then, so um, I have to say there are just a few mistakes, really not many. So you can see again how uh, the sort of face threatening act is mitigated. So maximizing dispraise of oneself in order to protect the other person's face. So the people who criticize or the person who criticizes the tense mistakes of the other person says, I mean, I'm not really sure about the tenses myself. Yeah? And I'm pretty bad at commas myself. So before criticizing the other person, they admitted their own weaknesses. And that is definitely uh, showing respect and concern and uh, mitigating face threatening acts. Okay, and the last uh, study I would like to share with you is um, a study which is called Learners' Voices on Collaborative Learning and Joint Meaning Making in the Language Classroom. So I wanted to find out what my students think about uh, working collaboratively, sitting in groups of four and working in groups of four. So what do they think they can really gain from working collaboratively in the language classroom? And for this purpose, I drew up a questionnaire with eight closed questions and one open question. I also carried out uh, uh, follow-up interviews and uh, I also analyzed the learner diary reflections of all the students and uh, tried to find out if they commented in any way on the collaborative aspect of the classroom. So what I found was that students think that uh, the, they gain most concerning uh, the social skills. And also they said that working in groups is much more fun. What scaled, uh, what uh, ranged second uh, on this uh, scale was actually that uh, the classes when you work collaboratively are more motivating. And then students also said that they could gain, of course, in terms of language. And um, students also said, and that surprised me most, uh, that they were, uh, they had the feeling that they learned from also from weaker students. Um, and this also came up in one of the follow-up interviews. And I remember it was a very good student working with actually a very weak student. 
And the good student said that she had benefited from working together with the weak student because she had to explain everything again. And by explaining, she realized that there were some, still some things that hadn't been so clear to her before. And uh, these are actually two quotes uh, from learner diary entries. And uh, they were, um, I took them from the first uh, reflections after the first class, actually. So first semester students and first class. And uh, that's what they said. Uh, what I really liked about this course so far was that we were allowed to discuss our ideas and thoughts and share our knowledge and grammar. I hope this will continue throughout the semester. And the other student said, I really enjoyed the class today especially the group work, as I think discussing, debating, and talking is great fun. So we're now coming to the last part of my presentation, which concerns uh, online teaching, the online teaching, which has been going on for three semesters now. Um, actually, I uh, have used my, and am still using my personal WebEx room. I started out with Jitsi at the very beginning when we uh, were told that we had to teach online. I used Jitsi, I came across uh, this um, video conferencing tool by chance. And um, we also have to document all the work uh, on the learning platform, which we call Moodle. And I actually have done 100% synchronous teaching from the beginning of <laughs> the corona crisis uh, from the beginning of online teaching, because I thought it was necessary and important for the students to have a regular schedule. So I've got three courses um, in the week, which start at 8.15 in the morning, and we always met at 8.15 in the morning. And uh, this way, we all had a clear structure uh, on our day and I think the students also appreciated that. So I did not do asynchronous teaching. Um, we also do our oral exams via Webex, of course, and uh, we do our written exams on the Moodle platform. And um, as I can't uh, seat my students into groups of four, uh, what I do, I work a lot with breakout uh, rooms, breakout sessions. And in these sessions, we do collaborative writing, uh, students test each other, they work on several tasks, they do exercises together. But I also actually, and I'll mention that again later, I also asked them, especially in the 815 classes, I said that first they should take a few minutes to socialize and to say hello to each other and also to talk about the weekend, for example. Um, in addition to the learner diaries, which I use in all my English classes, I also started uh, to use uh, les, so, les journaux d'apprentissage. In the singular, it's a journal d'apprentissage uh, in my French courses. And as that was just a try, so I did it for the first time this semester, actually. Um, I didn't give the students any guiding questions. I just said, reflect on the course. And I thought, um, well, I had just see what comes out of it. And I told them, uh, because I taught uh, A1 and A2 courses, I, I told them that they can, of course, also reflect in German. And some of them produced mixtures of, in, uh, of French and German. And um, actually, for me, uh, in, this, or in these three semesters, what was most important was the effective component. I think it became even more important than it had been before. And that's why I decided to do 100% synchronous teaching. And I also, as I was just saying, um, encouraged my students also to socialize in their breakout rooms because there are so many actually first, second semester students who had never been on campus and who don't know anyone who have never seen the university from inside. So I think that was an important thing to do. What I also did, not from the beginning, but um, when I had got a bit used to uh, teaching online, I always um, started to play music five minutes before the course started so that students got into the right mood, maybe. I hope they liked my music. Uh, what I always did actually from the beginning, and it was a very spontaneous thing, I'd never thought about it before, 
I always welcomed and greeted the students individually. So when they came in, um, I always mentioned all their names. And uh, of course, we keep uh, have kept in, in uh, email contact and um, sometimes students also shared personal information with me. I've had a few students who told me that they have mental health issues, they have developed them in the corona crisis. And well, I tried to help as best as I could. So I would like to share with you uh, just three uh, extracts from learner diaries. Uh, this is a learner diary from a student in my EAP class. And the reason why I wanted to share it is actually because, as I told you earlier, uh, every student has to send me their reflections only once during the semester. Of course, they have to keep it during the whole semester. But this student, he sent me um, his reflections after every lesson. And I found that very nice. And I would just like to scroll down here to show you one passage. So it was a fun class that turned out more interesting than I initially thought it would be. My goals for now are to get my hands on a copy of the mandatory book that was actually after the first session and finish the homework by tomorrow. I will definitely keep this reader diary up and send it weekly since it offers a great way to revise the lesson's content. Then this is an extract from a learner diary also from an EAP student. So she really kept to the guiding questions. What did we do in today's class and how, why did we do it? And again, she also commented on the collaborative aspect and she said, we got divided into groups of three people, which I now really like. Uh, that was an, a reflection which came in later uh, in the semester. So not after the first class. It can be a bit awkward at the beginning. So obviously when I first sent them into breakout rooms, she found it awkward, but I got totally used to it. I think the great thing about it is that you often get to know the people in your course better and this creates a more pleasant atmosphere in the class. Also in group chats, we can work on finding solutions together and learn from each other. And then she said, we posted our solutions in the chat so everyone could see them and we could discuss them together, which is also very helpful because so we get a detailed feed feedback in class on what we could do better. And the last diary I would like to share with you is a diary from a second semester grammar course, um, not grammar course, sorry, French course. So A1, second semester, the student had just uh, started learning French. Um, and you can see that she started in French. Yeah? So dans le dernier cours de français, etc. And then she said, das ist die beste Übung. So she actually uh, mixed the two languages, which is perfectly fine. So actually, that's the end of my talk. I thank you very much for listening and also for participating and uh, writing your thoughts into the chat. And um, I would like to now ask Christian to pass on the questions to me. <laughs> okay, um, thank you very much indeed, Anja, for this very inspiring, as someone was saying in the, in the chat, inspiring um, presentation. So, um, muchísimas gracias um, por un talía con una visión más o menos completa um, sobre el proceso de aprendizaje independiente. Um, there were quite a number of comments in the chat, and a lot of them um, focused on students' well-being. So, the, you know, the, the affective and emotion, emotional mm -hmm. damage of language learning mm -hmm. is very important. Um, and I think someone, and, and you also mentioned the effective dimension in your presentation, um, but I think people are interested in what else you're doing to 
um, help students overcome psychological barriers, anxiety, um, etc., um, both in the classroom and in online learning environments. I mean, you mentioned playing music and creating a positive classroom atmosphere, um, etc. So that would be the first question. Okay. So you mean, especially, so particularly in online teaching? Yeah. I think, so, yeah. Yeah. So I, I thought, or I still think what is most important is the personal contact with the students. And uh, therefore I always encourage them in class um, to send me an email if they've got any questions. I always say at the end of the class, if there are any questions and um, surprisingly enough, there are actually at the end of each class, there are quite a few questions always. So I realized from one class to the other that the students got more open and more willing to, to ask questions even in front of other uh, students. And I also said we can always arrange a personal WebEx meeting. Um, some students actually um, took the opportunity and uh, did that. And I did it probably with 10 different students over the semester. Um, and I always also tell them that they could always uh, send me emails if there are any questions. And actually I've had, I think, five students this semester to send me an email and tell me about their personal um, issues. And, um, and, and actually in all the cases, it was the case that they then did not attend the class regularly because they said, for example, we can't or I can't get up uh, in the morning. I am too tired and too exhausted because I can't sleep, etc. And um, I just told them they shouldn't stress. They should just log on when they are ready. If they don't log on, there is no problem. We can um, arrange a private chat and that's what we did. And we discussed actually the class content. So I always tried to show my willingness to help. So that's- Okay, the um, thank you very much. And there are quite a number of people in the chat saying that they, they have, you know, they've had similar experiences. Um, and uh, we do have um, two questions in the chat. And one of them is, do you ever find that students don't like being in breakout rooms or feel writing diaries is extra work that is not helpful? And um, um, so yeah. I've had this kind of feedback from some students in Hong Kong um, yeah. is what um, someone is saying. Mm -hmm. Of course. And to be quite honest, I never insist. So I, I always tick off the students who have sent me their learner diaries. But if I see that there are a few students who haven't sent me their reflections, I send out an email, a reminder. But then if I still don't get anything, I don't insist. Because I think that is also part of learner autonomy, being flexible. And if someone doesn't see the benefit of a learner diary, so be it, you know? So I don't insist normally. I try to, to show them the sort of purpose behind it, but if they don't uh, sort of grasp the opportunity, then I leave it. And there was another um, thing apart from the, there was not only the yeah, learner diaries. I just want to say there are now a number of comments coming in on learner diaries and someone is saying, um, I've seen students who complain about the diary journal at first, but sometime later they do like it and appreciate Absolutely. it. So, um, is that something you've also experienced? Absolutely, yes, yes. And uh, it, this happened actually quite often that a student in the reflection said at the beginning, I was not very much convinced of the benefit of this, but now I'm actually quite fond of it. And I think that's also what this student said, yeah, whose diary I showed the whole diary and he sent it to me. Uh, after every session and and I think he was first a bit skeptical and that's what students rather often say that they first were skeptical but then they have seen that it's quite a good uh, way of reflecting on, on on the class and keeping record of what they have learned. Um, and quite at the beginning of your talk you said that that developing learner autonomy is, you know, small steps or one step after the other. So um, mm -hmm. looking ahead into the future, um, what is your next step? My next step? I was just thinking of my first step, actually, and I still remember that first step. Uh, the first step was introducing learner diaries, but what I did was not ask every student to reflect on every class and keep a learner diary. I just asked two students in each class 
to reflect on the previous session and to present the reflection. And this went well in three or four courses. And in one course, a student after the reflection was presented by two other students, another student stood up, I would still remember that, and said she thinks that this takes uh, too much time from the contact time. It takes away too much time. And as for me at the beginning, this was really a challenge. I was not yet convinced whether it would work or not. So I didn't have arguments ready to really convince her of the benefit. And I actually dropped it. I dropped it in this particular class. I dropped it. Yeah? So you can see that uh, I also took a step back, for example. And the next step, well, I've been thinking a lot about self-assessment, actually, probably for two years or three years already. Um, apart from the peer reviewing, I would like to encourage self-assessment in my classes, but I have not really found a way of doing it yet. So, but that is something I would like to tackle. Okay, I think that is also something that came up during one of the sessions yesterday, so self-assessment. Um, and there is another question, a question about the breakout rooms and how you yeah. organize the, the, the work in breakout rooms. Um, do your students usually turn on their cameras while they're in breakout rooms? Do you think it is good to provide a nice environment? And another one um, closely related to this, what do your students think about it? So again, work in breakout rooms. Yeah, uh, think about turning on their cameras or working in breakout rooms. Um, can uh, um, I think it's just uh, in in whether they usually turn on their, their cameras yeah. and if yeah. you think it's a good idea, it is good to provide a nice environment. Yeah, yeah, uh, actually, um, especially in the last semester, now the last uh, online semester, I uh, put on Moodle the for information for the whole course um, and uh, one piece of information was uh, that I asked the students to always um, un to, to always mute their microphones and only unmute them when they speak but always uh, leave their cameras on and uh, in the courses where I've got maybe only 17 students uh, all of them always uh, switch their cameras on, but in the bigger groups, like 24 students, um, I've realized that it's maybe half of the students who keep the cameras on, and uh, the other half, they, they maybe even send me a message in the chat, uh, would it be okay if, if I leave my camera off today because, and they say, that, I don't know, they, they have a bad cold or they didn't sleep well or whatever. So actually, I was quite happy if half of the cameras were on, yeah? but in some courses, all of them were on. And I think it's a good way. It's good for all the others, of course, as well, to see each other. In my French courses, my three French courses, all the cameras were always on because there was a lot of interaction. Yeah? Okay. They, there don't seem to be any other questions in the chat, so... Um... And I think it's okay to finish a little bit um, earlier. If there are any additional questions, please post them now. Um, I think Anne would be more than happy to answer them. And it looks to me that especially um, this, this focus on learner diaries, and maybe that is something that can turn into a bigger um, project, um, you know, where, where people compare their work and how they use learner diaries in um, the classroom and um, I think your email address was visible in the last slide and um, so thank you very much once again for this very inspiring um, talk. Muchas gracias una vez más por su taller y su presentación y um, todo and um, I wish you all a remaining um, a wonderful remaining conference and um, see you in some of the slots um, later. And um, can we just post your email address in the chat? Because someone said, can you post her email address um, here? I think it's Anya Burkert123 at gmail.com. Post this one as well. Or I'll give you my university email address. Make any mistake, no. Yeah. Um, it's actually, Christian, it's anya.burkert23 and then gmail.com. Yeah. Okay, is that better now? 
That is much better. Okay, so please <laughs> use the second one or the university one. And so uh, thank you one once again. And I hand back to the um, hand over again to um, the organizers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Con esto damos por finalizada la plenaria, no sin antes recordarles a quienes nos siguen en esta transmisión en YouTube que se suscriban al canal para que puedan recibir las notificaciones de las transmisiones del programa académico de ILA 2021. Para quienes asisten a este congreso, los invitamos a, a, a ingresar a las actividades del día y les recordamos que pueden también ingresar a través del micrositio. En este momento también estamos abriendo la sala de networking que estará abierta hasta las 12 y 20 más o menos en el que podamos seguir colaborando y practicando y platicando sobre lo que está dando el evento. Thank you very much for being here. We end with this plenary today and we are just inviting you to go to the rest of the activities that we are holding today. Please remember that we also have a networks hall where you can go and we can continue chatting just as we did today at 7 a.m. So see you around. Thank you very much. <laughs>